Okay, so we go to the next chapter. So the next chapter is um, we're going to learn point-to-point -point, uh, communication. This is the beginning of um, this is the beginnings of communication. We'll talk about how processes can end up talking to each other um, later. In the next chapter, we're going to talk about collective communication. We're going to talk about more efficient ways to um, to do communication. But first, we'll start with the basics, sends and receives, um, the blocking versions of those, and talk about how they work. So um, to start off, we'll do um, the, the simplest of communications. We're just going to take one process. One process is going to send a message to another. Um, just to demonstrate how this is going to work, we're going to draw a random number on one process. We're going to print it out on that process so that we know what number it drew. Then we're going to send that um, random number to the other process. And the, the other process is going to print what, um, what value it had before this, the receive, before it receives that message. And then it will print the value that it had afterwards. And so we'll actually see that uh, you know, we're getting the correct random number from the other process. So here's our code to do that. So I think I already have it saved. Uh, yeah, I'll, I already have it saved here. So I'll just open it up. Close these. Okay, so let's explain the let's explain the code real quick. Um, so first we have to import NumPy. Um, the reason we have to do that I mentioned earlier in the implementation of MPI, MPI for Pi, there's two ways of doing communication. We can do it using Python pickle object, um, which is something that's unique only to Python, or we can do it with uh, NumPy arrays. Um, the pickle, the pickling method makes for um, really convenient code in Python, but uh, it's a little slower than the NumPy arrays. And so we're not even going to bother with the, uh, the pickling methods. Though, just so you can see, they are, let's go to the appendix. So we have different functions we're gonna be talking about. send and receive. So the this one is capitalized. This one uses the NumPy arrays. And we also have um, what I'm calling lowercase communication. So same thing, send, but with lowercase. The lowercase versions use the pickle objects. And the, cap, uh, the capital ones use the, uh, the NumPy objects. Um, the cool thing about that is, so for the the capital, uh, the NumPy message sending, you can, you know, you have to initialize. You have to do everything in NumPy arrays, and so you have to initialize variables as NumPy arrays before we use them. With the other one, the lowercase, you can just, you know, throw your, uh, you can basically just throw your um, Python objects in there, and it'll figure out everything for you. And, um, but, uh, but we won't be using that. So let's go back. Okay. So we're going to import NumPy and then import the MPI module for convenience save. Com world is com. Then we're going to save the rank. Each process is going to save its rank and then Notice there's no condition on this statement. And so every process is going to call, uh, or every process is going to initialize this variable. And so I, I mentioned we have to initialize all our variables as NumPy objects. So I just use zeros to do that. I'm going to initialize these variables just as uh, NumPy arrays contain zero. And so like in the previous chapter, we can separate the code into 
two different objects. Uh, this is only going to be called by rank one. It's going to be called by rank zero. So rank one is going to draw a random number. Rank one, we use um, NumPy's random uh, methods. So random, random sample, and it's just going to draw a random sample from the uniform distribution from zero to one. Um, so I have that here. Just give me a random number. Um, and then process one is going to print the number that it drew. It's going to state its rank so we know it's process one. And then it's going to give us the number that it drew. And then we're going to send it. So send is a, uh, an instance method of the communicator class, so com. We're going to send random number and its destination. We're going to send it to process zero. So process zero is going to run through this code. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to get here and ignore everything here. And then it'll get here, and it'll start um, into this chunk of code. So rank zero um, is going to print out the number that it has for random number. And we initialized it as zero, so it, it'll just have a zero in there. And then it's going to receive the message. So we call a receive object that we're receiving. Um, this is just where we're going to save the number. So it's just going to receive whatever message is coming to it, and it's just going to save it into random number, and it's coming from process one. So we specify we're looking for a message from process one. And then we print, again, the process, so we know who is printing this message, and then it's going to print the number it received. So we can verify that the communication is working correctly. So open up terminal. We can all do this at the same time. Um, MPIEXC. And let's just do two processes because we only have code for two. We could do more and it'd do nothing. Um, nothing else. And uh, let's run our code. Oh. Okay, so process one, it shows what number it drew. And then process zero, before receiving, it had just a zero. And we can see it correctly received the number that one drew. And that's our first send and receive. Okay. Um, so the syntax here is in the manual. Um, there's some extra, there's some extra syntax. You notice that um, the defaults for some of these parameters, the default destination is zero, the root process. Um, there are tags um, associated. Um, we'll have an exercise we'll, where you'll get to test out the function of tags. Um, there's some example code here. Um, just one note about these sends and receives. The, send and receive that we're using here refer to as blocking functions. And so what that means is that um, when a process, for example, um, when a process calls receive this, blonk, this blocking function, it's going to sit idling until it receives a message. So it'll sit there waiting for somebody to send it a message. There are, um, there are non-blocking versions of these functions, I send and I receive, and you can look them up in the appendix, where I stands for immediate. Um, in essence, um, so when a process calls I receive, uh, it's going to send a message to the system to notify, hey, I'm looking for a message, but um, it'll move on. It'll move on in the code, and it'll do some useful work, and then check back later to see if the message has been received. Sometimes the message is all, already going to be there. But um, uh, the point is that with these immediate sends and receives, these, these non-blocking communications, we can see dramatic improvements in performance. Um, 
the biggest inefficiency in writing parallel code is that you have one process sitting there idle, waiting for the others to give it the necessary information. And so instead, when it calls receive, instead of sitting there waiting, um, it's just gonna move on and do work and be, be productive. Um, uh, they can be a little more difficult to work with. You have to be a little more careful, but um, um, we won't really talk about them in this class because we're going, um, they're a little more advanced, but we're uh, gonna be using what we'll call later uh, collective communication for efficient communication. Um, also, just as a tip, uh, when you call receive, you can uh, you have to specify what the source is. So you have to say, oh, I'm looking for a message from process zero, from process one, from process two. There are a couple predefined variables that come with MPI. One of them is this any source variable. So you can set source to any source, and that will allow that receive to receive a message from any process that happens to be sending something to it at that time. And that can be convenient for a couple applications. Um, and just to know, if you want to write it at least this way, because it's object oriented, you would first have to import from uh, MPI, from MPI for Pi the package, um, the MPI module, you'll have to import any source that way, or you can just use the syntax source equals MPI dot any source. Okay, so, um, now, now that we have basic communication down, it's time to paralo uh, parallelize our first algorithm. So to start, we're going to use um, the trapezoid rule, numerical integration. It's just the, you know, the simple thing we learned in uh, beginner calculus classes. Um, the trapezoid rule, just to remember, you have a function, and that function we, uh, we can divide the interval, uh, uh, um, divide up the inter interval that we wish to integrate into slivers, and then we can calculate, or we can evaluate the function at each of these points in that interval. And then we can calculate the area of these trapezoids on each sliver um, and add up the area of all these trapezoids together, and that will approximate the integral of the function. Um, and as the number of trapezoids increases, the accuracy of our estimate increases. Um, so um, let's implement that in, in Python. So first, to start off, let's just write the code uh, to do it in serial. I have the code already saved here. Okay, so I've ha I have this set up so it'll grab um, parameters from the command line. Um, so an example to run it is going to be like this. So to do it that way, first I'm going to import NumPy. I'm going to import the sys, uh, the system module. And here I'm going to save my command line arguments. So I have it set up where A is going to be the, um, the beginning of the interval, B is going to be the end point, and N is going to be the number of trapezoids that we wish to, um, you know, that we wish to use in, in our approximation. Um, uh, to do that, first Python, we just refer to the system module and it's, um, um, it's attribute, the argument ver uh, vector. Um, the first one is actually going to be the file name of the program we're running. So that would be, in this case, uh, trapezoid serial.py. And so um, because we want the second one to be A, we'll save that. And then we have to uh, cast it as a float to make sure that we have a float here. So B will be the next one. And N we want to cast as an integer because that's just a uh, a number, the number of trapezoids. Here, I'm just going to arbitrarily define a function. So I'm just gonna do x squared um, as the function that we're going to be integrating. And then here, 
um, I have uh, defined the function integrate range, which will integrate f from a to b with uh, n trapezoids. Um, and so I've implemented the this trapezoid rule. I've done it um, basically following this. Um, but I'm adding up, um, I'm adding up the function evaluated all, at all these points. Um, if you telescope this out, um, expand this sum, then you'll, uh, or if you expand this sum, you'll see that the half, um, because there's two of each of these, half is going to, to go away. We have the endpoints here, and then we have to multiply everything by the trapezoid width, which is uniform, which is equal to this. Um, so in my code, just to note, I'm using linspace. Linspace is going to give me here n plus one um, endpoints, so that'll be n trapezoids, and they'll be evenly spaced from A to B, and I'm going to evaluate the function f at each of those endpoints and add them up. But to compensate, um, just according to our equation up here, I had to subtract off half of this, which just compensates for this, because I'm adding in that sum, I'm including the endpoints in lin space, and so I have to subtract half of this, or, or this, I have to subtract and then at the end, I multiply integral by the width of each of these trapezoids. And then I'll return the integral. So serial, uh, serially, I'll call, I'll call this function. And then it'll call my function integrate range. And then it'll print the problem in the result at the bottom. So let's just run that in serial here. do it with 100 trapezoids. Okay, so it printed out, we ran it with 100 trapezoids. The estimate of the integral from zero to one is 0 0.33335. And so that looks correct. It's the integral of x squared from zero to one. Okay, so now let's, um, let's parallelize this. So um, typically, there's two ways to go about parallelizing um, an algorithm. Yeah, question. Yeah, because it's just a, so far, we haven't used MPI in that script. It was just a normal Python program. Um, OK, so to parallelize something, there's usually um, there's two approaches. Typically, um, they're parallelized by command or by function or parallelized by data. So in this case, we have data that we need to compute. That's just the value of the function on all these trapezoids. And, um, and so we just need to split up the data among the processes evaluate all those trapezoids on different processes. So you can see that um, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's an easy thing to do because you see by the additivity of the intervals of um, integrals, you can separate integrals, you can split up the interval on integrals and, and, and you have equality. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate out the integral or the interval of the integral um, from A to B. We'll separate it into however many um, separate 
different chunks that we want, each, uh, each chunk being given to one process. So if we had two processes, we'll just split up the interval in half, and one, uh, one process will calculate the integral on one interval and the other on the other. That's kind of the idea of what we're doing, but, but we're actually just splitting up the number of trapezoids. So let's look at the code for that. Okay, so here it is. Let me open it up. Okay, so again, the way to run this, this time we use MPI EXE. We can specify how many processes we want to use. Four seems to be my default. Um, call Python. And then we're inputting again the, um, the parameters in the command line. So if we wanted to run with 10,000 um, 10, trapezoids, the idea is that these 10,000 trapezoids, if, um, if we uh, want to run that, say, on two processes, then one process is going to take 5,000 of these trapezoids and calculate them. And the other process is going to calculate the other 5,000. So to start, um, let's go through the code. Import NumPy, import uh, the system module. We'll import the MPI module. And then here, I'm going to be using any source. So I'll import any source from MPI. I'll save my communicators com. Here, I'll ask for the rank, uh, the size. We'll take in our command line arguments. Again, I'm going to define, arbitrarily define a function, just x squared. And then here, here's the same function from the serial version, integrate range. I'm just going to be using the same, the same exact function from the serial version of the program. And the reason why I'm doing that is because, so uh, like I said, we're just separating out the, in, uh, the interval among the processes. So each process is going to call integrate range, except each process is not going to call integrate range from the true A to B. Instead, we'll divide up the uh, we'll divide up the range if we're running with two processes. Then we'll run from A to the midpoint on one process. On, on the other process, we'll run from the midpoint to the end. And here, because if we're just doing two processes and we want to calculate 10,000 trapezoids, then we'll input 5,000 trapezoids here. And so each process will calculate 5,000 trapezoids on each interval. So it's the same code. And so each process saves the definition of this function. And then here we get into, we start getting into the details. So each process needs to know the width of the width of the slivers of the trapezoids. Um, we'll show why in a second. So here, local n, I've called this variable local n. This is the number of trapezoids that each process is going to calculate. Um, so if we input 10,000 trapezoids into the command line, then, and if we're running on two processes, then size is going to be two, which means that local n, local n, just means that um, each process is going to know to calculate 5,000 trapezoids on its own. Um, just one note, it's really important that uh, size um, evenly divides n. Um, so when we go about specifying the number of trapezoids that we want to calculate and specifying the number of processes that we want to run on, if we don't, if those, uh, if, if size doesn't evenly divide n, we're going to run into an error. Um, just to note, um, when you write parallel code, all the as much as you can, you want the parallelization to be all under the hood. So if I specify 10,000 trapezoids, if I specify n equals 10,000, um, 
know, it shouldn't matter how many processes I choose to run on. So I should have this code generalized to be able to take in any number of trapezoids with any number of processes, and it will give me a correct answer, and it will do it efficiently. In the exercises, um, where you're going to do that, um, and it's going to introduce one, um, it's going to introduce a concept called load balancing, where when you divide those up, where you div you divvy out the the number of trapezoids to each process, you want to you want to divvy them up evenly, because if you give one process a ton more trapezoids to evaluate than the others, your parallel code is only going to run as fast as its slowest member. And so if one is giving so much, if one has so much more work than the others, then you're, it's not going to finish until that one process that, um, completes. And so we'll uh, do that in one of your exercises. So um, now, now that we have local n, the number of trapezoids that each process is going to compute, we need to calculate the ranges on which each process is going to evaluate um, the integral. So that's where local a and local b come in. So a and b, a and b were the endpoints of this interval. So now we want to calculate the endpoints of each new subinterval that each process is calculating. So um, if Again, if we had two processes, um, one process, its local A is going to be the true A, the beginning, and its endpoint is going to be the midpoint. And on the other process, its local A is going to be the midpoint, and its local B is going to be the true endpoint. So to do, to do that here, each process is call, uh, calling the same code, but it has a different rank. And so when the root process comes through, uh, comes through the code. It has rank equal to zero, so it calculates its local a, and it's equal to a plus zero times local n times h. And so you see that it's just going to be equal to zero. Um, local n was, uh, in the case of 10,000 trapezoids, it was 10,000. So local n is going to be 5,000 times times the width of each of the slivers. And now that I look at it, I might, there might be um, a better way to do this, but, yeah. um, but we'll just do it this way. Uh, local B, again, so process zero comes through, um, and it sets local B equal to local A plus 5,000 times the, the sliver length sliver width. And so the root process is going to, that'll be 5,000 times the width. So that'll put it at the midpoint. So the root process is going to go from A plus 0 A to the midpoint. And then process 1 with rank 1 will come through. Local A will be equal to A plus 1 times local N times H. And you notice that was the same thing as here. So Process one will come through, and local A will be the midpoint, and local B is the midpoint local A plus half half of the distance of the interval, and so that will be the true endpoint. So now each process has a lo local A and local B. It has uh, its intervals. We're going to initialize some variables. We want to say the value of the integral in this NumPy object, and receive buffer, which we're going to use for our send and receive just on your variable. And then here, each process gets here, and it starts performing its local computation. So we defined the integrate range function, and it was the exact same as the serial version. And so each process calls this, but with its own parameters, local A, local B, local N. So it calculates the integral on its own range. And so now we have the value of the, in each process has the value of uh, the integral on its own range. And now we're gonna communicate those values to each other and, and, and then add them up. So um, the root node, uh, the no or the root process, uh, process with rank zero is going to initialize this variable total 
Um, so it'll save the value of its own integral, which it calculated up here, into total. And then it's going to iterate among all of the processes. <coughs> so so this is generalized to any size of communicator, any number of processes. So it'll go from one to whatever the size was. It's not including itself. So it's going to be receiving from um, this many places. And it's going to grab it from any source. I could, uh, I could change this so it'll, to receive them in order. I could put the I there. So it'll start by receiving from process 1 and then 2. But I've set it up so um, it doesn't have to receive them in order. And it's not really, it's, it, it, it might be a little faster, but, but there's, there's a lot better way to do this anyway that it really doesn't matter. But I'll be receiving from them in any order, and I'll just receive size many times. And then I'm going to be adding, I'm going to save the received um, value of the integral from each process into receive buffer, and then I'm just going, going to be incrementing them, adding them to total. Then all the other processes in the meantime. Yes. Um, it should only send one message. It should buffer at once, and then once it receives it, it should delete it from the buffer. So it shouldn't. You know, you shouldn't run into that error. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so it's, it, uh, um, if one, if one of the processes were sending twice and we actually wanted to separate those sends so that we wanted to make sure that we know which message we're sending and that we're getting the right message, you can use tags, um, which you can look into. You can look in the manual and see what the, the tag parameter does in your sends and receives. And that way, you can uh, you can label the message that you're receiving. And so you can say, oh, well, I only want to receive a message with this tag, or you can say, oh, I only want to receive from this process. And but um, if that process here in this case is only sending once then once uh, the other uh, corresponding uh, process receives, it should be deleted from the, the buffer and you shouldn't receive the same message twice. So, so that, that shouldn't be an error that comes up, but yeah. So um, all the other processes here um, are going to be sending um, their calculation of the integral. And I didn't put anything here because the default is to send to the root node. So all I have to do is just send the value of integral. So everybody is sending except for the root node, uh, the root process, which is receiving size many times, or size minus one many times. Um, and then at the very end, we'll just print our results again. Only the root node will uh, send it because only the or only the root process has the, the correct value for total, or even has the value total at all, the variable total. So let's try that out. And this time we'll do it with a number like 10, 10 processes. Ten thousand, uh, ten thousand trapezoids, and it works just fine. Ten thousand trapezoids from zero to one, point three 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 three. If we run the same thing in serial, get the same exact answer. 
So we know that our parallel code is behaving exactly like the serial code. Yeah, um, yeah, we're going to talk about that. And and one of the things, so one of the things about timing um, is it's a little different. So a lot of times people will time their code using like the Linux command, the, the timer thing. It'll send the process to to whatever. But um, you have to time parallel code in a special way because um, you don't want to. You really don't want to compute a CPU time the amount of time each process is spending on the CPU, um, because sometimes some processes uh, processes are idling, and so they're really not using the CPU, which um, would be a, an inefficiency in your code anyway. Um, well, it would be an inefficiency in your code, but, but actually it's important to measure um, not to use CPU time, because that time that it's idling, that it's sitting idle, um, you want to time that too. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that CPU time, like the time that's reported, times how how long it's on the thing. But, but because communication is so important and idling is such an important part of code, that you want to be able to calculate um, the time, even to all these processes you spent idling. So you want to know like the true end and the beginning. And you do that with a function call in MPI called wall time, w time. Um, which we'll actually talk about a little later. We'll talk about performance and we'll run some exercises to see some, some performance. But, but this um, brings up a good point before we finish for today that um, writing parallel code introduces a lot of overhead into your code because it has to initialize MPI. It has to initialize these communication um, channels. And so it has to do a lot of stuff. So if I'm parallelizing a simple algorithm like this, my parallelization probably made it slower, unless I was running a huge problem because there's so much overhead. And also the communication that takes place between processes is really slow. We talked about InfiniBand early, this local area network um, that, that runs on it so fast, but still um, the communication is the slowest part of a parallel program. And so when you're writing parallel algorithms, you want to uh, as much as you can, minimize the communication that takes place, minimize the number of sends and receives. And so, um, um, so what you'll see happen is as maybe as the problem gets bigger, for problems like this, um, you'll run it in serial and it'll be pretty fast. And then you run it with, um, you run with a couple more pro uh, processes and it might get a little faster and a little faster and a little faster. But as you add more and more processes, there's more and more communication going on. And at some point, the amount of work that each process is doing, because you're dividing up work, the amount of each process that each process is doing um, is going to get so small that adding any more nodes is going to add more communication that will be slower than the actual time that it takes to compute. And so there is a limit to to how the speed ups that you can attain through parallelization. And we'll talk about that in something called Amdahl's Law later. But, um, but yeah, this, uh, this, uh, this concludes the chapter for today. We mentioned load balancing earlier. Um, you'll also read about why this parallel code will fail when the, the size of the communicator doesn't divide the trapezoids uh, evenly. Um, read this last section, and that will help you to complete the exercises uh, for this chapter. And that's it. So, thanks. <laughs>